Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I want to give you a big welcome uh, to the first grand rounds of our season this academic year. We have like an unbelievably crystal clear, beautiful September day to get started, which is an awesome thing in New England. And I hope all of you have had great summers. I think we have a really wonderful um, lineup of grand rounds for this academic year. I know that Marge Overheiser has sent you a list just so you can sort of peruse and see um, all the different speakers who are coming this year um, to give grand rounds. So with, I'm hopeful that you all will have as many opportunities as possible to come and uh, to learn here with us. Um, I always enjoy when our very first grand rounds of the season is in celebration of Women in Medicine and Science Month. I think we have um, brought together an exceptional group of speakers over the last eight years or so um, in celebration of Women in Medicine and Science Month um, with us, and today will be absolutely no exception. So I do want to just um, mention before I introduce Dr. Audrey Tirka, our speaker for the day, that uh, immediately following this, we're going to do a little room switcheroo. And then at about 1.15, um, we're going to proceed with our um, career talk, which we've done every year um, uh, in celebration of Women in Medicine and Science Month. And this is going to be a spectacular career talk. I think we have a really robust um, group who are, are going to attend. If that's something you haven't had a chance to RSVP for and you'd like to be there, we have room and we would definitely welcome you. And you might just um, let Caroline Rotundi in the back uh, know about that. And speaking of Caroline, I do want to give her a warm thank you for assisting with helping us put together um, this uh, afternoon, um, uh, both in terms of the Grand Rounds, along with uh, Marge Overheiser, but also in terms of the career talk. So I'm just going to give you one little round of applause here for that. And Dr. Tirka's um, career talk, just um, for you to know, is Nature, Nurture, and Navigation, My Path to Leadership and Career Satisfaction. So I think that's something we can all learn a lot from. So I really will welcome you. And without further ado, I want to introduce Dr. Audrey Tirka. As I said, I am really delighted to welcome her to McLean Hospital. Um, as you'll see from her intro, intro and her talk, um, it's a very timely talk and something that I think at McLean Hospital we're interested um, both scientifically and clinically in her subject matter today. Dr. Tirka is the director of the Laboratory for Clinical and Translational Neuroscience at Butler Hospital. She's a professor of psychiatry and human behavior at the Warren Alpert uh, Medical School, Brown University, and also the director of research training in the adult psychiatry residency program at Brown. After earning her MD and PhD in medicine and psychology through a combined program at the University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Tirka completed her psychiatry residency and training in clinical neuroscience at Brown and Butler Hospital. She is a leader in the field investigating the biology of risk related to childhood trauma. Dr. Tirka studies maltreated children and adults with early adversity and has identified important neuroendocrine, neuroimmune, epigenetic, and cellular aging processes that underlie risk for anxiety and mood disorders and related health conditions. She is also currently engaged in studies um, that use novel treatments and diagnostic tools to understand and treat PTSD and depression, including functional neuroimaging, EEG, and brain stimulation therapies. She's a National Institute of Health funded investigator, which she's been for her whole career, um, and in uh, incredible demand internationally, has lots of trips as visiting professor, I've just learned, um, all over the world this coming year. And so we are really fortunate that she's here with us today to talk with us about stress and adversity, the effects on hormonal, metabolic, and cellular aging pathways. And please welcome Dr. Tirka. OK, thank you so much, Shelley. It's a great pleasure to be here among uh, such valued friends and colleagues. Uh, this is my first uh, women in science and medicine talk, so I'm thrilled to, to be selected for that. And it's also my first time having had my name on a parking spot right in front of the building. <laughs> so thank you so much for that. Hmm? 
I don't have any disclosures for this talk today. Um, and I'd like to begin by talking about how I got interested in this field. Uh, as you may hear in the career talk later, and I do encourage you all to come to that, um, I was e pleased to hear that it will not be videoed, so I may tell a few secrets. Um, and I will say that I first became interested in kind of nature, nurture type questions uh, during my youth, um, related to my experiences in my family. And in my uh, graduate work, you know, I was doing a, a MD, so learning about biology and medicine, and a PhD in psychology, so I was very interested in exposures and experiences and how the two come together in a nature-nurture type of model. But it wasn't until I really started on the inpatient unit at, uh, in my psychiatry residency at Butler Hospital and Brown Medical School where I really became fascinated in this topic from a research perspective. The patients I was working with uh, almost invariably had terrible childhoods, right? I'm sure many of you have experienced this. They um, often grew up in poverty, um, were abused or neglected, experienced domestic violence, neighborhood violence, and uh, often other kinds of traumas and atrocities. So I found that to be very compelling and, and interesting um, from a scientific perspective. And notice that along with that came, along with their psychiatric conditions for which they were hospitalized, came a variety of health conditions in otherwise relatively young people. And the older I get, the younger I, I think that was. You know, people in their 30s and 40s with hypertension and diabetes and obesity and asthma and chronic pain. I'm sure you've all, all seen this. So I was very interested in the connection between those, and I, I thought about studying them. So I will remind you here about the HPA axis. Um, this is a system that regulates the basal activity of several physiological processes in the body and, of course, importantly coordinates or is one of the main coordinators <clears throat> excuse me, of the stress response um, in, in which it mobilizes resources and allocates energy to the systems that need them most when you need to flee or fight when engaging or, or running from a stressor. So <clears throat> glucocorticoids are produced, cortisol in humans from the adrenal gland um, as this system is activated, and um, I'll be talking today about mitochondrial activation. Mitochondria are increasingly understood to play a central role in the stress response. Uh, gluconeogenesis, producing glucose molecules, which the brain needs to survive as fuel. Uh, pro lipolysis and proteolysis, freeing up other sources of energy for the, the body to use. Um, I should have mentioned insulin resistance, so uh, preventing insulin from being highly activated allows more glucose to be available in the bloodstream, which again your brain needs. And shutting down system or systems or altering systems that really aren't necessary in the moment when coping with a stressor or trauma. Catecholamines are also activated that increase the blood pressure and the heart, heart rate and shunt blood from uh, other systems that aren't needed, like the GI system, into the, into the brain. Now, this system is wonderful when you need it acutely, but if it's activated excessively or for a prolonged fashion, it can have significant deleterious effects on a variety of organ systems. The glucocorticoid receptor is critical for, it's a, actually a transcription factor. So there are glucocorticoid response elements um, in the nuclear DNA that the glucocorticoid, the bound glucocorticoid receptor binds to and serves as a transcription factor. And that's how the actions of cortisol are mediated. Um, and also one of those actions is to serve in a negative feedback loop at the level of the pituitary and hypothalamus to shut this system down so that it's not excessively activated when possible. Now this slide shows in, on the top in green therapeutic actions of glucocorticoids, in red deleterious effects of glucocorticoids. Um, certainly we're very interested in the neuropsychiatric uh, effects and system, 
also the immune system, metabolic processes, cardiovascular system, and others. As you can see, glucocorticoids have wide-ranging effects. And in this talk, I will be speaking about effects on the telomere and telomerase maintenance system, which are influenced by stress, uh, excessive activation of glucocorticoids, concomitant activation and elevations of insulin. There's an increase in adiposity and uh, elevations of inflammatory cytokines, which are produced through immune cells, but also through fat cells. Uh, oxidative stress can occur through activation of the stress response system. Mitochondrial activation, which I'll talk a little bit about later, produces reactive oxygen species, and oxidative stress can occur in uh, combination with that. And these all serve to impact this important system. So telomeres, for those of you who don't know, are um, these end caps on the ends of linear chromosomes. And they serve to protect the coding parts of the DNA. So when your cells divide, which they're doing all the time to replenish your organs, the DNA needs to be replicated. And in the process of the DNA being replicated, little bits of DNA on the end are shorn off. Well, if that would happen to the coding parts of your DNA, you'd be in trouble. And so these telomeres are essentially base pairs that serve as a buffer, and we can afford to lose some of them as we go. Uh, here you see the chromosome of an adult cell shortening over time. When telomeres reach a critically short length, the cell goes into senescence uh, so that it no longer replicates in order to protect the DNA. There is an enzyme telomerase that's present in some cells and at certain levels that can, in some cases, add base pairs back onto telomeres. So this system has been likened to a biological clock. On average, older people have shorter telomeres than younger people. Um, and uh, some people have looked at telomere shortening as a predictor or a disease model that may provide information beyond chronological age. And indeed, telomere shortening has been linked to a variety of disorders. Uh, you may note many or most or all of these are disorders that I mentioned uh, in relation to the experience of people with early stress and trauma. Uh, this is a meta-analysis conducted by uh, Catherine Rideout, who is a, a research training program resident with us in, in our group at Brown. Um, looking at the association between major depression and shortened telomeres. And um, you can see here, here are all the individual studies, and you can see here that there is a modest but significant effect uh, association of major depression with shorter telomeres. Now we've known for quite some time, there, first of all, there are individual differences um, in telomere length, but also that toxin exposure, such as cigarette smoke or radiation, can shorten telomeres. And for about the last 15 years, we've known that psychosocial stress is also associated with shorter telomeres. So back in 2004, Alyssa Eppel and colleagues looked at um, mothers of children who had special needs. And she looked at caregiving in relation to telomere length in leukocytes. And what you can see is a relationship such that more years of caregiving were related to more telomere shortening. Now, when she looked across groups at both caregivers and controls and asked them about their perceived levels of stress, because we all know that everybody can have stress exposure and not just those who are in this particular stress group, she did find that those who identified themselves as having higher stress had shorter average telomere length in leukocytes, and they also had lower levels of that enzyme telomerase that can put base pairs back on telomeres. So we were very interested in this, and, and we looked into the literature and noted that telomere shortening naturally occurs at a substantial pace in early childhood. And because we were interested in childhood exposures, we... I'm going to ask you to stand a little closer. A little closer. We have a big audience okay. inside, and they're having trouble listening. 
Okay. Um, we were particularly interested in childhood because we knew that there was a, a substantial effect of aging and or of getting a little bit older in early childhood on telomere length. And so in this small pilot study of 10 healthy adults, no psychiatric disorders, no medical conditions, but a history of childhood maltreatment versus 21 with no history of childhood maltreatment, looking in leukocytes, we found shorter telomeres among those with the history. Now more recently, we have replicated this uh, or looked at this in a study of 290 adults. Um, this design was a little bit more complex. So here we have telomere length on the uh, y-axis, and here we have a group with no childhood adversity. And by that, I mean no history of childhood maltreatment and no history of childhood parental loss. And they also had no history of psychiatric disorder. Then we looked at those with a, with a history of childhood adversity, but no history of psychiatric disorder. Here we had those with a history of psychiatric disorder, current or past, but no childhood adversity. And here we looked at those who had both. And here were the findings. So as you can see, shortening of telomeres with adversity and disorder uh, was, did not reach significance in the group with adversity. Um, who did not have disorder. When you looked at it irrespective of disorder, both parental loss and maltreatment showed significant effects with telomere, shorter telomeres. And when you looked at it irrespective of adversity, you can see that a variety of disorders showed effects. Um, interestingly, past, so we didn't have anybody with current substance abuse because uh, we were concerned about effects of that on some of the biological measures we were taking. Um, past substance abuse did not have a significant effect. Uh, lifetime PTSD, large error bars, we only had 12 individuals in that group. And the reason um, for these numbers, I should have mentioned, these were uh, adults without chronic medical conditions and without medications. So um, most people, many people who have significant disorders will be taking medications and would have been excluded. We were interested in, in looking at risk processes in particular. So again, Catherine Rideout um, and others in our group conducted a meta-analysis here, now looking at the effects of early stress on uh, leuco uh, leukocyte telomere length, and again, a modest but uh, significant effect. Okay, now I'd like to turn to the role of mitochondria. I mentioned this a bit earlier. <clears throat> mitochondria are present in every cell of the body, or nearly every cell of the body, I should say. Um, and they're particularly um, prominent, the, the numbers of mitochondria and the uh, size of mitochondria and the amount of mitochondrial DNA is higher in tissues that have a higher energy demand like the heart and the brain. Mitochondria have their own little circular DNA, which is quite unusual, an organelle that has its own DNA. And, um, Mitochondria have a variety of functions. Now, we all learned in high school that mitochondria are the... Thank you. Good job. So mitochondria produce ATP by taking the food we ingest, combining that with oxygen, and producing ATP, the energy that our cells need. But it turns out they're also critically involved in the stress response, immune function, and they're co-regulated with telomeres. So as I mentioned earlier, they produce reactive oxygen species, they're involved in calcium regulation, and uh, importantly, cellular aging and cell death. Now the mitochondrial DNA, these little circular, small circular genome, there are multiple copies in each mitochondrion. Um, all genes are critical to functioning of the electron transport chain. That is that process by which food and oxygen are turned into ATP for energy. And in, importantly, mitochondrial DNA contains glucocorticoid response elements. 
mitochondrial DNA coordinates with the nucleus, and the nucleus coordinates with the mitochondria to regulate the activity of mitochondria to regulate the stress response. I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Oops, I meant to say. And um, interestingly, when there are impairments in mitochondrial function, um, in some cases it's been shown that there can be a compensatory increase in the number of mitochondrial DNA available. So if the function is reduced and you have more of the circular mitochondrial DNA, you may result in a, a better output. This is a slide um, by Martin Picard, uh, Juster, and McEwen from 2014. Um, really updating uh, Bruce McEwen's allostatic load model, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, this paper uh, centered mitochondria, if you will, in the mitochondrial allostatic load model, and the paper was entitled something like putting the gluc back in glucocorticoids. Um, and the reason for that is they're focusing on the effects of stress here, um, and as I mentioned, that stress and cortisol uh, catecholamine increase results in gluc uh, glucose increases with insulin resistance. Oftentimes, there are behavioral activities that also um, exacerbate this process. I won't go into detail, but I'll just mention that they identify numerous problems from uh, animal studies, identifying problems with um, stress and uh, elevated levels of glu glucose on mitochondrial fragmentation, uh, mitochondrial quality, damage to the mtDNA, uh, reduction in the um, energy producing capacity, and a susceptibility to cell death. Um, as I mentioned, they're co-regulated with telomeres, and so you get telomere shortening, among other primary outcomes, and then basically organ system failure because these processes, both glucocorticoid activity and mitochondria, are happening in all of your cells in the body. So we were interested in looking at this in relation to what we had found previously with telomeres in the study that I just told you about. Um, and so we, mitochondria are very difficult to study. Um, they undergo fusion and fission, and um, in order to study mitochondrial um, respiration, one needs to do that with live cells, so you can't do it in a high throughput kind of way. Um, but you can look at mitochondrial DNA, which is very stable. And so we did that in stored samples uh, from this study that I mentioned earlier. And here are the results. Now, as you may recall, previously with telomere shortening, we had a reduction in telomere length. Here we have an increase in mitochondrial DNA copy number in association with both childhood adversity, childhood maltreatment, and parental loss, as well as psychiatric conditions. Again, if you look at it irrespective of psychiatric condition, you see effects of adversity. And again, if you look irrespective of adversity, you see effects uh, with psychopathology. Um, this is a very new area of inquiry in humans especially. Um, and so there's all, you, I don't expect you to read these. I hate when people say that, don't you? Um, but it's just to say there have been just a few studies in this area. Um, and there have been a few published since this review, again, by Picard and McEwen, who are leaders in this field. Just a few more um, looking at cell-free mitochondrial DNA, which is something our lab is pursuing as well. Uh, Kai and colleagues in a very large study um, replicated uh, effects of increased mitochondrial DNA in association with childhood trauma and particularly in those who had major depression. So I've mentioned glucocorticoid receptors and mitochondria and their co-regulation. We are very interested in how that might be expressed in our data. So, um, here we have, in the extracellular space, cortisol enters the cell, the glucocorticoid receptor binds, and as I mentioned earlier, there are glucocorticoid response elements in the nuclear DNA and also in the circular mitochondrial genome. So you can have glucocorticoid receptor binding to mitochondrial DNA, um, with, and you can have also glucocorticoid receptor binding to nuclear DNA. Um, 
each of these influences the other. So you can have increased expression of nuclear genes that regulate mitochondrial DNA. There are hundreds of nuclear genes that are involved in mitochondrial processes, including mitochondrial biogenesis. And similarly, mitochondria with this binding can regulate the nuclear DNA to enhance the stress response. So we looked at it again in this study of adults with and without a history of childhood adversity and with and without um, uh, psychiatric disorders. We had previously shown um, that those groups with adversity and uh, psychiatric disorders had uh, reductions in methylation of the glucocorticoid receptor. And methylation alters the gene expression of the receptor, and this is a proxy for that. We're looking at CPG sites. These are uh, sites in the DNA in the promoter region of the gene. So presumably, altered levels of methylation may alter uh, whether or not this gene is transcribed. And so we did a um, structural equation model uh, looking at the relationship controlling for relevant covariates between early adversity and mitochondrial DNA and asking the question, does uh, uh, methylation of NR3C1, which is the glucocorticoid receptor, mediate the association between adversity and empty DNA copy number? And indeed it did. Very strong uh, relationship between these two, uh, methylation and mtDNA, and when you put this into the model, um, this effect was mediated. So perhaps suggesting that this may be a mechanism of these effects. Now I'm going to turn to some work that we've done in children uh, in collaboration with my colleagues Ron Seifer and Stephanie Parade, who are developmental psychologists at Brown. Uh, many years ago, we developed a study looking at children age three to five uh, from mixed-race, impoverished families in Rhode Island. The families were studied in the home. We had about half uh, who had been maltreated, uh, who were identified through the Child Welfare Service, and about half who were um, impo mostly impoverished, but they had not been uh, maltreated, at least as identified through the uh, Child Welfare records and also by report. We um, conducted interviews and questionnaires with the families. We assessed additional exposures because, of course, unfortunately, child welfare, there's a lot that can happen that child welfare is not aware of, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on the system, I suppose. Um, and we measured, uh, we sampled saliva. We looked at saliva DNA. And for this talk, I'll be discussing telomere length and mitochondrial DNA copy number. We also did a six-month follow-up. And I would mention that this, um, at least this episode, the documented episode of maltreatment, occurred quite recently in the last uh, six months. So here we have... Um, measures of adversity, maltreatment, which we recruited on, as well as these other measures, tra other traumatic events, as well as a measure of lifetime contextual stress that we um, employed. And then up top, you see a composite measure where we combined all of those. And what you can see is that uh, telomere, uh, these uh, measures were all significant for telomere length in saliva, as, and most of them for mitochondrial DNA copy number in saliva. And here you can see this is telomere length at baseline, telomere length at follow-up, and similarly for empty DNA copy number. And what you can see is small to modest effect sizes uh, that are pretty consistent except for at baseline with the mitochondrial DNA. These effects show up uh, later on, uh, six months later. One other thing I would point out, I don't know if anyone has caught this yet, but contrary to our expectations, these associations are positive. So telomeres were actually longer in this sample in association with this, and almost nobody has reported this before. Um, although this is a unique sample, very few people have looked at children at this age. Nobody has looked at children immediately or in the six months following maltreatment. Um, and um, the findings for mitochondrial DNA were in the direction that we anticipated based on our prior work in adults. 
Here you can see the data for maltreatment at baseline and follow-up um, for mtDNA copy number. This was not significant, uh, but at follow-up it was. And here is a, an interaction effect such that uh, we saw increases in mitochondrial DNA over time at, at the six-month time point, but only in those who had experienced one or more traumas. Now, what about behavior? Is it, is it associated with psychiatric symptoms or behavior? Uh, we looked at the CBCL and found that both uh, telomere length and mitochondrial DNA were associated with internalizing behaviors. For those of you who don't work with children, the, those are uh, like depressive and anxiety type behaviors. And externalizing behaviors were associated uh, with telomere length, but not with mitochondrial DNA. And if you look at the individual time points, you see a similar uh, effects as before. These are in the positive direction for telomeres, um, as well as for mitochondria. So in summary, this is the first study to look at mtDNA copy number or at mitochondria at all in children um, and or in children with adversity. And um, this, the findings were consistent with our prior work. But in contrast, as I mentioned, the telomere findings were not. Um, we were buoyed by the fact that the findings were so consistent overall with a variety of adversity types, both at baseline and follow-up, and also consistent with the mtDNA uh, copy number. Um, and as I mentioned, this study is unique in a number of ways. Um, we wondered whether there might be acute compensatory effects, possibly relating to telomerase, which we were not able to measure in this study. Um, and similarly, the delayed effects of the mitochondrial DNA findings at six months, we thought could be related to an active process and a delayed effect, possibly relating to impairments of mitochondrial function. But again, we were not able to measure that in this study, so that's just conjecture. Uh, we are now following these children up at about age 10, um, and we are doing this in, a, in the setting of a summer day camp. So this is in Exeter, Rhode Island, which is not too far away. It's about 20 minutes from Providence, so you can do the math for you. If, if we um, have anybody here who'd be interested in volunteering, we have all levels of faculty and trainees and students and volunteers. I'm especially interested in underrepresented minorities, if anybody would like to participate, but all comers um, will certainly be uh, uh, discussed and, and uh, considered for, for this opportunity. It's a really wonderful experience. Um, the kids have a great time. It's an opportunity for us to, here I'll show you the next picture, to give back to the kids, um, many of whom have never been swimming. Um, this is, you know, several hundred acres in the woods on a pond. They get to participate in wonderful camp activities. And then we carefully structure it so those fun camp activities don't interfere too much with our uh, standardized research assessments, which we are able to do in a standardized way here in a way that we could not do in the home. A lot of our other assessments happen in the home. Often they are tiny homes. Uh, not, not the fancy tiny home, by the way. <laughs> um, I'm not talking about, you know, the prefab model we're all interested in buying for ourselves. Um, but uh, often very small living situations with multiple children running around, a lot of chaos. Um, so this allows us to really do this in a controlled fashion, to give back to the families. They get a free week of summer camp. Um, we do some home uh, visiting prior to the camp to assess um, the parent report of how things have been going. We give the child an actigraphy watch. We're measuring activity and we're measuring sleep. We assess physician records. We have them report on diaries in terms of their activity and any illness and medications. Um, and then at the, oh, and we also are reviewing, as I said, physician records and child welfare records. And then in the camp, we're doing a whole variety of assessments, looking at a range of endophenotypes and um, behavioral and cognitive phenotypes that relate to both psychiatric disorders as well as the related health conditions that I've been talking about. 
Okay, so last series of studies. I'm doing well for time. Um, in collaboration, so of course in these studies with humans, we're very limited as to the tissue we have access to. Um, we're lucky if we have access to blood and um, otherwise saliva. And uh, as you may have seen in the previous slide, we're also getting hair samples and stool samples. Um, but we don't have access to the brain except insofar as we can do EEG, as we're doing in collaboration with Diego Pizzagalli, um, and certainly cognitive tests, and one can do imaging, although with young children that can be uh, tricky as well. Um, so in collaboration with Kevin Bath and also Catherine Rideout, who I mentioned earlier, we've been doing a study um, looking at an early life stress model in rodents, in mice. So this is a limited nesting resources model that was adapted from Tali Baram's bedding manipulations, adapted by Sullivan and Roth, and then further adapted by Kevin Bath. It takes a village. Um, limited nesting resources. So the dam, the mother, and the um, Pups are on this wire mesh cage, which is kind of uncomfortable, and then they're given just a little cotton nestlet. It's not really enough to make a comfortable, adequate nest. Um, this drives significant st stress in the dam, and it changes the frequency of mom and pup interactions. And so, um, and Kevin uh, and his colleagues have looked at this and found elevations in serum corticosterone in the pups at postnatal day 16 in this condition, as well as um, reductions in the um, performance in the wire hang task, so they give up earlier in that condition. So we were looking, uh, we're interested in looking at this circular mitochondrial genome that I've been mentioning, and in particular at expression of these mitochondrial genes. And we first looked in the hippocampus, okay? We also first looked in male mice, although we are certainly expanding that to females as well as to other brain regions. Uh, we sampled the um, hippocampal tissue immediately after the early stress exposure, and then at several time points across development into adulthood. Here you see the genes uh, and the effects of age, so that's the developmental process. You see a significant effect for each of the genes. No main effects of early life stress, but a variety of interactions of early life stress and developmental timing in several of the genes, most of the genes. And what that looks like is that early on, right after the stress exposure in P12, you get a ramping up of gene expression in the hippocampus across many of these mitochondrial genes. But then over time, you get a reduction in the early stress group in red compared to the control group in blue, and extending less or so, but still significant at age P50. So now I want to return to, um, or turn to, return to humans, and I want to talk about the, the social effects of this and, the, and what I consider to be the social justice implications of this work. So <clears throat> these are data from Rhode Island. People familiar with the ACEs study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences study by Felitti and colleagues um, in the Kaiser Permanente system about 20 years ago, they first looked at um, the prevalence of a variety of common adverse childhood experiences, many of the ones that I've been telling you about, um, childhood maltreatment, you know, abuse and neglect, uh, domestic violence, uh, parental incarceration, um, parental mental illness, parental substance abuse, and um, they found that overall these experiences were very common in the, general, in the Kaiser Permanente population. And um, they also studied people over time to see what that was related to, and they found that exposure to a variety of adversities was related to a whole host of medical conditions, including psychiatric conditions, but also others. And, um, we have data from Rhode Island. It may be similar. It's probably pretty similar to what you have in Massachusetts. If you look at 400 percent 
of the federal poverty limit. And this is the percentage of those who are exposed to adverse childhood experiences. In blue, you have zero adverse childhood experiences. 400%, does anybody know what the federal poverty limit is for, say, a family of four or an individual? Any guesses? I, I didn't hear that. I'll tell you, it's a lot lower than interns make, and I know interns feel like they don't make enough money. Um, it's $25,000 for a family of four. So that's a very small amount of money to live on, especially imagine living on that here in, in Massachusetts. Um, <clears throat> so if you have 400 times that, that's $100,000, and you're doing pretty well. 80% have n none of these adverse experiences. Now that's not to say, of course, that wealthy people don't abuse their children. Um, I like to say that, um, you know, parenting, I, I, parenting is certainly the hardest, hardest job I've ever done. Um, and it's a job that we're not actually taught to do. We're expected to just learn by modeling, I guess, um, despite the fact that we know that many of us aren't good at it and many of us have our own particular challenges, uh, either with parenting or many children are particularly hard to parent if they have ADHD or other kinds of conditions. Uh, where they're not, you know, very uh, well controlled or following the rules. So uh, it's an incredibly difficult job. Um, and they're probably, even among this group, there's probably a lot of adversity that isn't measured in the ACEs scale or doesn't come to the attention of the, uh, the interviewers or the measurers. So, nevertheless, it is striking to see that 80% of people who are at that uh, income level do not have any ACEs. In contrast, those who are below the poverty limit, 80% have one or more of these ACEs, okay? And then there's a linear effect in between. So I want to, um, and this is really going to close the talk with a, a long and complicated slide, but bear with me because I think it's really useful to think through this. And it touches upon a number of things that are critically important that I wasn't able to talk about today and, and that some of you have more expertise in than I do. So I encourage you to think about it and talk with your colleagues about it. So this is, uh, these are the adverse childhood experience exposures identified in the original ACEs study. And today I spoke about some of the biological impact um, I focus particularly on the endocrine inflammatory uh, metabolic cellular aging processes. We talked a little bit about the brain in the animal study I told you about, but of course many of your colleagues are looking at that. Uh, Martin Teicher and Carrie Ressler, among others, looking at effects on the brain, um, and Diego Pizzagalli, of course. Cogni so you see changes in the systems that I told you about. Importantly, changes that are happening in the brain that influence cognition and influence affect and behavior. Well, as children are growing up, they are experiencing those effects. Also, the psychosocial effects, of course, major attachment issues, particularly when the adversity or the trauma has been perpetrated by a caregiver or a trusting adult. Problems with socialization, self-efficacy, and they're carrying those problems into their relationships with others and into the classroom, right? And then in the classroom, oftentimes there are problems with executive function, so problems with planning, problems with behavioral control, impulsivity, problems with memory, persistence, uh, all of the things that children need to be able to sit still, to be able to attend, to be able to learn, and to be able to be liked by their peers and their teachers. Not surprisingly, perhaps, a lot of this can lead to risk behaviors, either uh, as a sort of self-medication to try and manage some of those feelings, uh, also because a lot of these risks are prevalent and present in the immediate environment in some cases. So you can have 
uh, effects with smoking, alcohol and drugs, sexual risk, changes in diet we mentioned earlier, changes in sleep, and legal problems. And then, of course, there are further social problems, problems like homelessness, crime, criminal behavior, and prostitution, unemployment, poverty, which leads to a lot of this, and guess what? Poor parenting, right? Because parenting is the hardest job there is, and especially if you've been through all this and if your kids are struggling with the same kinds of challenges. And then, as I've mentioned, all of this has been linked to a variety of psychiatric disorders, as well as a host of medical conditions, which we've all seen on the inpatient and other units. And critically, suffering, disability, and early death. One study showed that people with several of these risk factors died an average of 20 years earlier than those who did not. So I ask you, is this the American ideal? And can, can we really expect these folks to pull themselves up by their bootstraps when a lot of this is really embedded biologically? So with that, I will uh, thank my uh, mentors and collaborators, um, faculty members, many collaborators, postdoctoral fellows and students, and of course, our funding institutions and our local agencies who have collaborated with us on this work. I do want to mention that uh, with a number of really wonderful colleagues, uh, we're starting an institute at Brown called the STAR Institute, the Inst Institute on Stress, Trauma, and Resilience. And um, I hope you'll see more on that in the coming months and years. Uh, we're busy partnering with local institutions, local researchers, various stakeholders in the community. We're writing center grants and uh, really figuring out how to um, really advance the cause that we're all deeply concerned with. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Questions? We have our microphones ready. I know it's a heavy topic. <clears throat> seeing none, seeing none yet. I would just ask um, this. First of all, this is an incredible talk, and it's just a perfect representation of going of true translational research, going from basic very basic science all the way up to social justice and population health. And I just applaud you for being able to squeeze all of that into this amount of time that you had, which is remarkable. So I just had wondered whether or not, I know in, in many of these areas, um, we've identified some sex and gender differences. And I just wonder if your work's shown any of those. Um, yeah, um, we have seen sex and gender differences here and there, in particular in our work on um, HPA axis function, which I did not show here. Um, we do often include women who are on oral contraceptives or hormonal contraceptives. You know, we often get into this problem of if you exclude everybody who might have a condition that could interfere with what you're studying, then you end up with a rarefied group that doesn't really represent what's happening. And there we always look at the effects of hormones on these processes. I would say, um, and we certainly looked at sex differences every, in everything that we're doing, and increasingly so as more attention has been brought to this. Um, at this point, I would say there is not a clear pattern. Um, some studies show some differences, other studies show others. And I think that could be due in part to something that really plagues this area of research and most areas of research, frankly, with humans. And that is that, that we are incredibly complex with a variety of influences, uh, both, of course, genetic and biological, but also exposures. And, you know, how we perceive those exposures may impact the, may, may influence the impact of them. It may not be just objectively was that stressful, but what was my perception of it? So measuring all this and measuring gender effects as relates to all that, sex and gender, and of course now um, gender is a spectrum and we've got you know complex issues there to address as well. So um, 
The answer is to be, to be determined. Uh, we, we have the data in the, in the mice uh, with females, and we're just now looking at it. So I hope to have some answers there. Two, two quick questions. One is, um, with, with respect to poverty, there are many pockets of the world where poverty is not only endemic, but it's the norm. And I'm wondering whether or not you've ever t thought of transnational studies to investigate that. The second question is, with regard to childhood abuse and, and trauma, have you ever um, dissected phases, early childhood, middle childhood, teenagehood, and see whether or not resilience develops over time, and whether or not within a family where this abuse is endemic, whether some resilient children show none of the wear and tear on their telomeres or their mitochondrial DNA. Yeah, I think those are critically important questions. Um, and both, I think, kind of getting to the question of resilience and what are the various impacts in a given individual in a given context over a given developmental period. Um, I wish we had more answers. Yes, I've certainly considered it, and many people in this field are actively considering it. I'm actually, Shelley mentioned, I'm actually going to do a visiting professorship in Brazil where um, my colleagues there have studied a large population of very impoverished children, and that is the norm. Um, and I have yet to see, we've collaborated on some mitochondrial findings I've heard about, uh, effects on mitochondria in relation to their imaging effects that they can still pull out um, when they measure degrees of exposure to poverty and other types of adversity, even when the existing environment is more commonly an impoverished one. Um, the resilience question, I think, is key, um, and there really isn't enough work yet on that. We hope to, in the STAR Institute, the R is resilience, and we hope to really focus on that. Um, it's, some people think of it as sort of the flip side of adversity, but that's not quite getting at it, right? There are, uh, and there are a number of studies here and there suggesting particular resilience factors that may really protect an individual, biological factors, exposure factors, individual um, social support factors. Uh, and also, there are a number of studies suggesting certain developmental time periods are critical for certain results. You know, brain development happens over time, and some structures and circuits develop quick, more quickly than others, for example. So it's a very active area of research, but I, I can't say that there's a summary uh, of the topic yet. Thank you, Audrey. That was a really great talk. Um, you know, talking, thinking about resilience, it's, uh, it's actually quite challenging also because uh, you mentioned Marty Teicher's work and uh, it's shown really nicely, um, for example, there is a latency between the occurrence of abuse and the emergence of depression, sometimes, you know, six, nine years or so. So um, somebody actually might not have expressed a phenotype uh, but still actually be vulnerable. Um, the, so that was a comment. The question I have for you is, um, of course, in addition to potentially addressing psychiatric symptoms, especially with the mitochondrial function, do you think that there are any treatment implications that you might derive from your work? Yeah, um, absolutely. I, I hope so. Uh, so let's let's uh, start with your comment. Yes, I absolutely agree. And um, uh, the resilience construct or concept is a very tricky one. Um, I, you know, I like to, you know, you used to think, well, I used to think of it as sort of a binary concept, and then I realized, well, given this multitude of risk factors for any given condition, uh, it's not binary at all, right? I mean, we're all sort of simultaneously at risk and resilient for everything we have not yet gotten. <laughs> And it's a matter of degree. And, you know, we start to collect conditions as we age, unfortunately. Um, so it's less resilience, perhaps. Um, but I, I absolutely agree with that. Um, 
It, with regard to treatment, um, yes, that is a, a critically important question, of course. And when we're talking about really systemic processes, um, I think it's important for us not to be just looking at one disorder and how we might treat that one disorder uh, because so many organ systems are affected. Um, a number of people, Alyssa Eppel in particular, have um, gone after uh, behavioral approaches, psychotherapeutic approaches, mindfulness, and people are studying yoga. There are many studies of dietary effects. Most of this has been done on telomeres less so on mitochondria, but there are also studies looking at many drugs influence mitochondria and mitochondrial function. Um, and there are also antioxidants, maybe, that can be targeted to the mitochondria. Um, so there's something called mito health. In fact, I had an odd experience, not so odd anymore, I think yesterday or the day before, um, and, you know, after obviously I must have been in PubMed looking at this or Googling something for a picture for the slide or something, and an advertisement for Mito Health came in my Facebook feed. <laughs> so yes, a lot of active investigations on that. Uh, certainly exercise, diet, um, both caloric restriction and certain uh, macronutrients, red meat, reductions in red meat, have been associated with longer telomeres. Hasn't really been studied yet, to my knowledge, with mitochondria. <clears throat> Hi, Audrey. Um, so your thanks for a great talk. Um, the thought that came to my mind when you were talking, maybe a random association, was thinking about when we had normal presidents and the stress of the office um, led to sort of aging yes. phenomena. Uh, and <laughs> it led me to think, like, um, do you have access to uh, potentially like skin stem cells, stem cells in either the blood or in skin? Because I know telomerase acts very differently in peripheral cells and in stem cells. Um, and thinking a little bit about the number of stem cells or telomeres in these stem cells, um, and if that could have an interplay with stress, given these sort of effects on hair color, yes. uh, aging, that sort of thing. That's a brilliant idea. I do think that some people have looked at that, but I, I can't produce that result for you offhand. But that's, that's a brilliant idea. Um, and uh, <laughs> I, I uh, appreciate your comment. I won't say more about the presidential politics. <laughs> Bite so, my tongue. So just before we um, <clears throat> conclude, um, and, and thanks Dr. Tierka, I just wanted to mention, I should have said this at the beginning, so we celebrate Women in Medicine and Science Month for the whole month, not just for one day. We should be doing it all year, but we're doing it for a month. And so one thing I do want to make sure that you all know is that we have an amazing opportunity on September 24th, um, which is that Dr. Nora Volkoff, who is the mm. Dr. Nora Volkoff, who is the um, director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, is coming on the 24th of September. She will be giving um, our neuroscience seminar that day and also giving a, t a career talk. If you've never heard her speak, it is a fantastic opportunity uh, to not have to travel to hear her, but to hear her right here. We're really honored um, that she um, has uh, agreed to come and celebrate uh, this with us, and we thank Dr. Bertha Madras and others for um, assisting us in having her come. So I would just encourage all of you to put that on your calendar because you actually don't really want to miss her talk. Um, so I also hope you'll all stay around for the next part of this event, which is the career talk. And I think you all will agree with me that this was an absolutely superb talk, and as I said, a tremendous um, uh, example of the type of translational research that we are so interested in here, which is you know going really from you know cells and components of cells up into the clinic, the bedside, and then into the population, and then thinking about these broad issues of social justice um, here in the United States and around the world. So I can't think of a better talk for us to celebrate Women in Medicine and Science Month today at Grand Round. So with that, could you please give me a round of applause?